Thank you very much, Professor Vadud, for accepting this interview for Feminism and Religion School in the Balkans. At the beginning, I would like to say a few words about you. It'll take her time to count all the achievements and contribution in the field of Islam and gender you have done, uh, but I will briefly mention some, some of them, something from uh, your biography. Professor Amina Vadud uh, uh, is a professor emerita of Islamic studies at Virginia Commonwealth University, but she currently lives in Indonesia and run her own portal, The Lady Imam. She is the Lady Imam of our time. And I'm really honored to get to know you and to talk to you and learn from you. So Professor Vadud studied Islam from Malaysia to the United States at several universities and also taught at many universities around the world. Uh, while she studied in Malaysia, she edited her uh, dissertation and later she published it in the book, uh, Quran and Woman, rereading the sacred text from a woman's perspective, uh, which is also translated in Bosnian language. Her Activism started while she was in Malaysia and together with seven other women, she organized the first pro-faith, pro-feminist organization, Sister in Islam, and uh, it inspired the network of Musava, global movement for reform in Muslim personal status law. Her second book, Inside the Gender Jihad, Women's Reform in Islam, was published in 2006 and uh, together with the numerous articles, lectures, and teaching uh, is part of her intellectual, rich intellectual legacy. Thank you, uh, Professor Vadud, for, for this interview and opportunity for uh, the students of uh, Feminism and Religion School in the Balkans to learn from you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I think you should add that the uh, Bosnian translation uh, is uh, uh, because of your uh, interest and generosity. Uh, and uh, I have known you, uh, you just reminded me since 2006 when I actually visited Sarajevo. So it is my pleasure and honor to be a part of this uh, initiative in order to help uh, anyone actually, you know, in any region of the world to understand you know, the dynamism of Islam, uh, particularly we are reading for gender to actually give a critical lens to how we understand our sacred texts. So thank you. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of this interview, I would like uh, to start with some basic questions uh, and uh, to ask you, how do you understand the intersection of gender, feminism, and Islam, having in mind that very often we hear that uh, uh, coupling or feminism and Islam uh, is oxymoron and it's not compatible? So how do you understand and define this intersection? Okay, I begin as I always begin. In the name of Allah, whose grace I seek in this and all other matters. I first have to confess that I have only been able to accept the label feminism since approximately 2009. I remember it because it was at the launching of Musawa that I realized <clears throat> finally, and this is the point that I want to make here, uh, the incongruence that I had understood or that had been promoted between Islam and feminism had finally been resolved for me. And that resolution, I think, is really important. But it comes down to this. Who defines Islam and how do they define it? And who defines feminism and how do they define it? There are some definitions of feminism that say you cannot be religious and you particularly cannot be Muslim and go along with this very secular and anti-religious definition of feminism. So that means that feminism is not universal. 
There are some, and of course we know about these, who define Islam in very narrow, patriarchal, hegemonic, binary terms. And of course, you cannot have equality in those terms. So over the years, working as I have in both academic and activist context, I came to understand the power of definitions and who has the power to control the definition of these two always changing terms. Islam has never been just one thing. And feminism has evolved over the last 100 years to even check its own racial uh, uh, and religious kind of narrow uh, projection. So I became a part of the movement to open up the definition of Islam and to open up the definition of feminism. And therefore I have a place where I can now be an Islamic feminist. So that's kind of how I bring the two things uh, together. Thank you. Um, in one of your articles, sir, you are underlying the importance of lived realities to the hermeneutics of the Quran that led to the knowledge production. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on this? Why lived realities <laughs> are so much important for the hermeneutics of the Quran? This was something that, you know, I think I was very fortunate to um, experience working outside of narrow academic context, particularly with uh, being one of the founding members of Sisters of Islam and being one of the resource persons for the Musawa movement. And that is that when we create the hermeneutical circle, that is the terms upon which we would make an understanding of sacred texts, of how those texts get put into uh, practice or implementation, whose reality is included. And in the classical period, there were literally no constraints against men centering their experience, their experience with the divine, their experiences with you know sincere understanding of Islam, but at the same time, not being located within the lived experiences of women, they just didn't calculate it. So a conscious part of the work that we do as activists is to consider that there is no text that has meaning except to the ways in which it is meaningful to real people in real context and women are people too. When you start to calculate that, for example, there is this universal agreement that Islam is about justice and that the goal of Islamic law is justice. And yet women were not experiencing that justice. So when the formulas for how we understand justice includes the experience of women, their ways of knowing, their ways of growing, their ways of understanding the world and acting in it, their experiences, their real life experiences, it becomes a powerful tool for stretching the boundaries of the hermeneutical circle to such an extent that they are people too. So that's just, you know, I mean, I don't think I could have understood that just working on uh, philosophy, theology, and hermeneutics. It took this experience of trying to implement these ideals of Islam in context with real women, that is, in the courts, in the communities, in the families, that really set it as an important dimension. And it's not a dimension that was missing. It's just that when men dominated the intellectual field, they centered their realities and their realities is only part of the picture. Yeah, and then also uh, I, I, I uh, remember that uh, you said uh, once women 
uh, start seeking uh, for knowledge uh, and authority, uh, they are challenged immediately uh, uh, as, as uh, those who are heretics or enemies of Islam, those who do not understand Islam well, uh, and then et cetera. Uh, it's, it's not the same for men. You know, although both women and men in Islam are, are uh, obliged to seek for knowledge and, and study Islam, it seems when women seek for authority and when they are engaged in knowledge production, uh, they are, are immediately challenged as, as, as those who disturb uh, the, the patriarchal structure of uh, the society, but also of, uh, of the community that, that, that represents Islam. Yeah, this knowledge production um, was also uh, a consequence of working simultaneously with activists and academics. Um, Islam is a knowledge-based tradition. I mean, the first word of revelation was to read. Uh, so there's always been this enthusiasm about learning and the learning was for hundreds of years unlimited. Like anything that there needed to be known, they you know, created the knowledge fields in some instances with regard to say medical science. So they explored without limits in the dimensions. Uh, and then we come to this very strange period that occurs after uh, the uh, colonial period. Uh, and there is a kind of retardation of this thrust for knowledge production. And there's a kind of stagnation it says <clears throat> all of the knowledge has already been known and all we have to do is follow it. They call it taqlid, which is following traditions. And sometimes those traditions are not only dead, but they're also useless, right? So the idea of knowledge production is that Islam as a knowledge-based tradition must continue to grow. It must continue to embrace everything that we experience all of the ways in which we experiment, that is the scientific method. And yet the critical reading of gender as part of knowledge production really lacked until just about the turn of the 21st century. Somewhere in the 1990s, the level of education for Muslim women was on the rise. And as a consequence, they also became knowledge producers, but they were limited because patriarchal hegemonic interpretation did not want to challenge their own entrenched position of privilege. So one of the definitions, for example, that needed to be challenged was the ways in which we defined authority. Authority cannot simply mean a male cis body person. If, no, if, if knowledge is so important, knowledge becomes one of the basis of authority. And Islam has never limited who might acquire that knowledge. So why is it that we find these traditional circles trying to limit whose knowledge production can become authority. So it is a simultaneous reaffirmation of the need for knowledge to continue to grow according to our circumstances in the real world, but at the same time to be able to assign authority for the knowers undescribed by their gender locations. So those two things go together. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you. I asked that question because when the translation of your book, Quran and Woman, uh, came uh, uh, in, in, in Bosnia, uh, we had a couple of book launches and then I heard some of the girls uh, that uh, were whispering in, 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 in small circles and I asked them, uh, what are you whispering about? And, and they said, you know, we want to uh, read that book, but uh, our teachers in madrasa should not know about it. And I said, and why? 
because they are afraid of being uh, labeled as feminists and, and as those who are troublemakers. So they wanted to, to learn, to study, but they are afraid of stigma and, and, and uh, pressure they feel within their institutions. And it was very weird. And every time when when uh, we mention uh, women, uh, prominent scholars like you, uh, there is a kind of a, 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 a fear you 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 can you can see in the eyes of some women who are traditional Muslims that they 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 think they're gonna do something problematic. They 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 will uh, they will somehow. Uh, go beyond uh, what is allowed and 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 etc. So it's it, it's very interesting, you know, to see the dynamic, you know, when when uh, uh, they are faced with these kind of uh, a knowledge. Yeah, I mean, we have to be sensitive to the restrictions that are placed on on knowing uh, by those sometimes who are in authority. Um, I've heard so many uh, interesting anecdotes about this uh, about this uh, book, which is uh, uh, 30 years old. It came out in the original copy was 1992. Um, and one of my favorites is from uh, an African scholar who said that when he was studying in the traditional schools, they gave out copies of my book so that the students could learn to refute it. But this is the thing that's interesting. This book has been out there for 30 years and nowhere has anyone ever been able to substantially refute it. Now, I can say this and it can sound egotistical, but the reality is that the methodology that was used was very clear. I put out what I was doing, I put out how it related to the trajectory of the classical Ulum and Quran, that is the sciences for the study of the Quran. And either you had to deny that those sciences were important to this field of knowledge, or you had to pretend that the conclusions that I made reading critically for gender using those methods was not uh, sufficient. So in both cases, what you are saying is that our traditional trajectory of studying the Quran is not sufficient. You can't say we only want to do it for the things that we are already familiar with because it is without limit. That's the nature of knowledge, it's without limit. Uh, it's unfortunate though that people still experience the pushback. And this is the thing that I think is very interesting. And one of the things I say about the women's movement in Islam, and that is the tsunami has already started. You know, when a tsunami comes, the first thing that happens actually is that the water level sinks. We can't quite tell what's going on, right? But what that means is actually it's gathering a momentum in the back. And when it comes, it's gonna come with a rush. This is the wonderful experience I have had, you know, in the 50 years that I've been Muslim by choice, is that you can't stop the women's movement. And even if the formal schools might pressure the girls in terms of their learning process, <clears throat> nobody's going to keep them from being able to read those books on the side. I mean, you know, let's face it. So you can't stop the knowledge just because you are afraid. The fear is really a reflection of a lack of knowledge. In my estimation, because of my relationship with the Quran over those 50 years, I don't think there's something that's gonna outdo the Quran. I simply think that the methods that we use to read it, to understand it, to apply it in our lives, that those methods might uh, not last as long as the Quran itself. However, they were so detailed, let's just say, that they do give us, as I call it, a trajectory by which we can continue to engage with the Quran, but at the same time, we can only do so from our lived realities. So there's a kind of beauty in you know, uh, being open to knowledge. Uh, sometimes I have, uh, you know, faith challenges or I have doubts or I have questions. I'm afraid of what's the answer going to be or suppose I don't find the answer that I want. 
And each time that I come to that, and as I get older, it becomes easier to simply say, I have to let go and let God, I have to trust. But if I deny myself already, then I will not see the truth when it comes to me. So I have to let go of, you know, the, the even the fear that I have within myself, because if I, if I don't open up and trust, then Allah cannot help me to receive, you know, what is the answers or the lack of answers even in, in such a way that, you know, I, as soon as I find myself getting like a little bit hesitant, I right away spot it now. I'm like, oh, that's the place where you want the answer to be this. And what you fail to do is to open up to, oh, Allah, give me the answer, whatever the answer is. And in doing that, although it has been challenging in several instances, and I think we're going to talk about one of those instances, although it has been challenging, the end result is that by being open and allowing myself to be afraid, that I start to find ways of reading that are more and more fine-tuned. And, and the result is that, you know, I mean, I've literally tell people, I've been in love with the Quran since I first read an English translation that today I can't stand at all to read. So that just lets you know the wisdom was already, you know, uh, it was already appealing to me. And I'm happy to experience that 50 years later that I'm still in love with the Quran. And that means that sometimes I've had to grapple with difficult passages or difficult ways in which these passages are being presented or the way they're used legally. So, yeah, I mean, I understand the fear because I've had it myself. Yeah, and when it comes to difficult passages, there are some uh, that are really uh, hard to, to grasp, to understand. And one of them is uh, very famous from chapter 4, verse 34. Uh, you are, are familiar with that, you uh, studied it and offered the, uh, uh, your own understanding in your book about Kivama, these concepts, Knut and Darb, uh, beating women. So very often uh, when uh, women uh, and, and, and men do not have any other arguments uh, against gender equality, they would say, oh yeah, God says in the Quran that... Uh, man uh, is the authority over women and that he has the right to discipline her. So uh, yeah, this is one of these difficult uh, uh, passages. So I would like to you to talk more about it. Well, first I just want to say, I don't believe there's a short answer to this, but I have learned over time that I can be a little bit too long-winded. So I'm going to try to be succinct. Okay. There are over 6,600 some verses in the Quran. There's only about six of them that presents problems to the extent to which we really have to grapple with them to understand their relationship to the rest of the text. And it is that relationship to the rest of the text, <clears throat> excuse me, that becomes um, a guidepost for even how we read those texts. When I first began working with verse 434, um, all I did was uh, epistemology, linguistics, and grammar. I sort of tried to unpack the meaning. Remember what I said at the beginning, that there is power and who has control over meaning. So engaging and understanding the possible spectrum of meanings I uh, was able to uh, sort of dismantle the notion that what it is saying is that men are in charge or that men have authority. There wasn't as much that I could do with the end of the passage where it says, and strike them. It's like too literal. So uh, over the years, the best that I could do was to put uh, some uh, doubt uh, as to whether or not the reading of that last statement constitutes the totality of the meaning of that verse. And instead, I would graduate, even as the verse graduates from separate from them, speak to them, separate from them, and then what the board and then strike. Uh, that was the best that I could do. But the methodology of the lived reality became an incentive 
the need to do even more critical reading. And that critical reading, which I talk about in my second book, Inside the Jinn and Jihad, is based not only on the totality of the Quran, but as I said, simultaneous with the lived reality. And if you look at the trajectory of even classical Quranic analysis, there were places where the scholars would intervene with text all the time. So for example, even in patriarchal, classical uh, or Jewish prudence work, they would say that the strike is supposed to be it's not supposed to harm. That's not in the Quran, but they were free to say it because they had observed lived realities and they wanted to put at least some kind of constraint on it, or they say it's Ramzian, it's symbolic. Well, the thing for me is that if you look at lived reality, any kind of strike, and even the threat that there might be a physical strike is in fact harmful. And so it in fact leads us to another level of Quranic dynamic interpretation, where we say, no, that the literal application of this is no longer fulfilling the Quranic ethos of justice, of rahma, or of mercy, of compassion and kindness. Uh, and so as a consequence, we will say, however this might have been relevant at the time of the revelation, we know certain things about human psychology and well-being, and we know from the, the vast global movement of, against violence against women, the VOW, VOW movement, we know that this causes harm. And if we have that knowledge and we ignore that knowledge, then we are not following the Quranic trajectory. So there is a dynamic relationship between what we know in our own lived realities and how we interact with the Quran, such that consequently we can say, no, no form of uh, a strike is going to be without harm and therefore we don't do it, we don't apply it. We believe it's in the text, we accept that it's part of the text, but we also accept that when things like slavery are in the text, and most of us find that to be abhorrent, that some of what was in the text is specific to a time period and the circumstance that is no longer within the full spectrum of the Quranic objective of guidance. And that guidance must confirm both justice and dignity. And the dignity or karama of the human being is unconditional, even by a particular verse. So we have continued to work on this verse. It's, somebody asked me on Twitter about it, like just in the last 24 hours. I'm like, you don't think I can put 50 years of scholarship into one tweet, do you? <laughs> but the reality is that I have two publications, uh, two books where I've addressed it specifically, and Musawa has two that they've addressed. And the first one is called Men in Charge? Question mark. I love the title because it's rhetorical just in the way it's laid out there. And it deals with so many aspects of not only that, how this verse exists and how a construct was made around it, but also how to look at the lived realities in relationship to the text. So it's, it's beautiful. And I like, you know, the methodology you used in your books. Uh, and uh, it just re uh, uh, reminded me to one of the anecdotes uh, during one of the researches uh, where we asked women in Bosnia, uh, have they heard about this verse and what they think about it? And one grandma was sitting in the room and she said, no, it's not true. It is not in the Quran. And, and uh, uh, we said, how come? Uh, and she said, no, 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 this is not true. Uh, if this is a true, our imams would have been talking about it. So uh, someone obviously lied on Allah. <laughs> so uh, 
that grand basically and then what 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 uh, what is happening basically imams uh, in 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 19th and 20th century, uh, when Ottomans left, uh, they've been trying, you know, to uh, present the knowledge from the Quran uh, in the way, uh, uh, similarly as as you do with your own methodology, you know, not to, you know, looking the reality, you know, looking the the lived reality, uh, and that's why they simply avoided these kind of texts. Not to uh, uh, not to basically uh, 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 support any of of, of uh, uh, violent actions that they obviously uh, have been in, in in practice. So that's mm -hmm. unbelievable. I mean, these kind of anecdotes simply tells us, you know, how even uh, religious authorities and, and imams grappled with with this issue and then found their own niche how to handle it. Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, with, when you say six thousand six hundred plus verses, you realize, wow, there's enough information in here that if I never read that verse again, I will still have a lot of, uh, you know, guidance and wisdom. But the important thing is Islam is called deen. It's a way of life. It's a way of acting. And the idea that, you know, there's a, only a uniform robotic way of acting, uh, obviously we've dispelled that. But uh, it, we, we have instead a much more complex kind of trajectory of the way, you know, that we act as humans. And uh, when we understand that uh, the greater wisdom of the Quran continues, especially emphasizing things like justice and dignity and all of that, it doesn't matter whether or not you, you know, it's not a... a it's not a commandment to say, you know, if you don't beat your wife, you're not Muslim kind of thing, but it is in there. And uh, it behooves those of us who are trying to understand, you know, the Quran comprehensively to give it some thoughts. And in my case, it, it took decades, uh, but, uh, you know, I couldn't continue to just sort of uh, shy away from it. Then that's because I didn't lead a community. If I led a community, then I would instead repeat the verses, you know, and I, you know, Allah made between you love and mercy. I would, I would emphasize those kinds of passages, which I do anyway, but I would emphasize them to such an extent as to eclipse, which again, I already do, to eclipse the other ones so that when we're talking to people, we are bringing them towards the message, you know, of love, the message of compassion. Uh, so I, you know, I can definitely see that that would happen and actually hats off to the imams who decided to, to make guidance from the merciful. I really appreciate that.